We started speaking last week about a subject called a defining moment. A defining moment. Defining moments are important moments in our lives. Moments when something so consequential takes place in our life that our life is changed from that moment going forward. And the things that have defined my life and the things that have described my life up until that point, in many ways, those things are elevated or changed in me going forward. Who I used to be yesterday is not who I'm gonna be in the future because I've been through a defining moment. There's certain key times in our lives that are defining moments. The moment that you got born again was a defining moment in your life. And the moment that you got born again, everything that used to characterize who you were and what you were about, all the limitations that existed on you as an individual changed in that moment. And from that point forward, after that defining moment, you began to walk into your potential and your destiny and what God had for you. We have defining moments in our lives. Defining moments are really important, but they, they are probably few and far between, and there's a handful of them that are gonna happen in your life. One of the things that I think is a defining moment in people's lives is when they're exposed to a particular move of the Spirit of God, when they're involved in an outpouring of the Spirit of God. It can affect you and touch you in ways where it elevates the relationship that you have with God and it puts you in a new level of understanding. It puts you in a new dimension of relationship. And because of that, the way that you move forward in your life is going to be eternally changed. Defining moments, defining moments are important. And so I want to continue with that series and what I want to speak about today, I've kind of given a subtitle of living in transforming power. Living in transforming power. God is in the process of doing something right at the moment. He's doing something and there are rumblings and shakings that are happening. And we're very much in the early stages of God moving into something new and something different. We don't always know what God's going to do. In fact, you probably don't know what God's going to do. I think if there's one thing that's characteristic about moves of God is that people live in the anticipation of what it's going to be, but they don't really know it. If you have a look at the book of Acts, you know, Jesus says to them, go and wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. They had no clue what the Holy Spirit was, how it was going to come upon, how it was going to evidence. They had no idea what it was going to be like, what it was going to look like. They lived in anticipation of that. You can't always define what God is going to do until you're actually in the encounter itself. You can't live in the expectation that God is going to do X, Y, and Z. This is what it's going to be. This is how it's going to look. We don't do that because God doesn't operate that way. I think part of what he's looking for is he's looking for us to engage with him in a level of trust where we sit and say, I might not be able to define what it's going to look like, but I'm going to trust you in the process. And I have to slow down because Hector told me that I speak too fast <laughs> and he's trying to translate into Spanish. We can't always define what's going to happen, but we need to trust him in moving forward. I think some things that are going to be characteristic about what God is going to start doing is, I think that the move that God's going to bring about is going to be characterized by something which is self-focused, individual-focused, but I think it's going to have a corporate expression to it. I think that God, what God is wanting to do is he's wanting to wo work in a dramatic way in the lives of individuals. And he wants to elevate their experience with God and bring them to a place where what they're living in puts them in a position to contribute substantially to what happens in a corporate setting. What you're going to be able to do in your own life as a result of the relationship that you enjoy with God is going to be important because it is a building block to what he's going to do in a corporate setting in here. So what it does is it creates an expectation and it puts a responsibility on us as individuals to recognize that what God is doing in me, he is doing in me not only for my own good, but he's doing something in me because I have a contribution to make when I go in it, into an environment that is going to bring about change. God manifests himself in a corporate setting in a different way that he'll often manifest himself in a personal way. 
But if we want to experience what God is doing and we want to have that encounter with God, it means that we have to come to a place where we have a mature, a more mature understanding of the fact that we have a responsibility to make to create the atmosphere in which we welcome the Holy Spirit and we create a safe place, a place where we honor him to come in and do what he wants to do. So we become contributors to creating atmosphere as opposed to going to church to consume and see what I can get. You'll get something in the process. But our, our attitudes needs to shift from consumption to production. So God is gonna start doing something. God is gonna start doing something. If you turn to Acts chapter eight and verse one, it's Jesus speaking and what he says is, Sorry, 1-8. See, you, 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 I was just checking. <laughs> Two people were awake. Nobody else was. I suddenly had a look and I was like, that's not it. <laughs> Sorry. Acts 1-8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. I just want to go that far. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. That's Jesus speaking. That's Jesus talking. So let's get a bit of context what's happening here. Jesus had already spoken to them and Jesus had, if you read in, in Matthew 28, Jesus had already spoken to them and he had given them authority. Jesus had said, all authority is given unto me, now I give it unto you. Jesus had given them authority. And what he said to them was, I've given you authority, but I'll tell you what, you're still not equipped to be able to handle life the way that I'm looking for you to handle life. You're still not equipped to walk into a situation where you're able to take the things of the kingdom and bring them into evidence. And so what I need for you to do is I need for you to go to Jerusalem and I need for you to wait there until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Because when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, he's gonna come and he's gonna give you power and you are going to become witnesses. Jesus' words to them initially was to give them some understanding of the authority that was available to them because of what Jesus had accomplished when he died and he rose from the dead. All authority has been given unto me. Jesus was triumphant. He won the authority. He told them about the authority that was accessible and available to them as believers. Yeah. But he said to them, Having the authority is only half the deal. I need for you to get the other half of the deal. I need for you to go and get the power that goes with it. You see, we as Christians, the word of God is vital to us because it's a foundation to everything that we have. And we cannot ever take away from the value, the inherent value of the word of God. The, in word, the word of God gives us an understanding and gives us clarity about the mind of God, how he thinks. It speaks to us about the nature of God. It speaks to us about the heart of God. What is the heartbeat of God? It gives us understanding about those things. The word of God gives us understanding about the authority that has been given to us as born again believers. Things that we have available to us through what Jesus has done. But although the word of God is important and although the word of God is so vital and fundamental and although it's gonna give you understanding about your authority, it doesn't give you the power. You gotta have the relationship to have the power. You see, the word is not a substitute for relationship. The problem with so many Christians and part of the frustrations that so many Christians have is that they've been exposed to the potential of the word of God. They hear about the authority that's available to them as believers and they get excited about the authority. They hear what Jesus has done. They hear about the life that God has prepared for them. They hear about how they're the head and not the tail, how God has made them victorious, how God has provided for them, how, God has, how Jesus has done everything necessary for them to walk into a dimension of living that he has designed for them. And so they understand the authority of it and they're trying to live out of the authority. And so because we're trying to live out of authority, we're quoting this and we're quoting that and we're binding this and we're loosing that and we're talking all the rest of it. The problem with it is what we're doing is we're living out of the authority and not the power. Amen. When you live out of the authority without the power, you're gonna end up frustrated and disillusioned. 
You have the authority. The authority tells you what is available to you, what rightly belongs to you. But if in order for you to walk into an experiential reality of what that is, you need to have the Holy Spirit and you need to have the power. If you don't have the power, all you have is the understanding and the knowledge. You've got to have both things. One thing that is so important for me is everybody has their own things. Like my dad loves eschatology. It's his, it's his favorite thing. We, we ban it from the house. We, <laughs> nobody's allowed to talk about eschatology when we're having meals or anything. We don't want to hear about it. But he loves it. If you gave him half a chance, he would talk about it all day, every day. That's his thing. My thing is I like for Christianity to be experiential. Uh, you know what? I must tell you, I'll, I'll confess something to you. I honestly don't know how I ended up in this position. I really don't. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm st I told you last week, I'm still waiting for God to come back one day and while well, he's been on sabbatical and say to everybody, what have you done? I leave you in charge for five minutes and look what happens. But there are so many people who've got much more knowledge, much more understanding, much more depth, much more history, much more experience. And I think to myself, good gracious, Lord, what on earth are you putting me here for? But it happens anyway. So the point is this. <laughs> the point is this. What was the point? <laughs> what was I talking about? The what? You've got to be experiential in life. That's my thing. You see, I got so wrapped up in experience, I got lost. But you've got to be experiential. You know, I, you, I, I, honestly, I promise you, I, if, if I had any deep theologians around, I'm sure they would be able to outmaneuver me under the table. And that's okay, I can live with that. I think the thing about it is, I think that the Christian experience is designed to be simple. It's not designed to be complicated. It's for simple people, I'm a simple person. Give me simple stuff that I can live by. But it's important, because God never designed for the lifestyle that he created for us to experience to be something that's a theological exercise. It's designed to be something that is lifestyle, it's not theology. The problem with it is, we make it so complex that we get caught up in reason and understanding. We're trying to always move through these, these um, um, intellectual gymnastics, trying to understand it. And I don't think it was meant to be that. It's supposed to be something that we can walk into. What's the point? The point is this. The, the whole reason for the Holy Spirit the reason for the Holy Spirit, if there's one thing that you've got to get today, this is the one thing. The reason for the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit makes the Word of God experiential. Without the Holy Spirit, you will never walk into experience or encounter. You will understand, you may know, you, you can have the broadest knowledge and understanding, but you'll have zero experience without the Holy Spirit. Because the whole point of it is what he's saying is, I want for you to understand and I want for you to live in transformational power. What he was saying was when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will live in transformational power. Transformational power changes you, changes circumstances, changes the environment in which you find yourself. Transformational power is found in the Holy Spirit. Part of the challenge that we have in the world in which we live in right now is that people have a vast knowledge or they have varying degrees of knowledge of their authority. The problem with it is we can't deliver in terms of experience. So what we do is we take control and responsibility and we try to live out of our own enabling. We try to make things happen. We try to be better people. We try to earn points with God. We try to do things to make our lives happen. And God looks at us and he says, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to get to a place where you recognize that the power you need to make things happen in your life, the power you need to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, the power you need to change your circumstances and situations comes from the Holy Spirit. Not from you. Don't try and do it. 
It's hard for us because as human beings, we don't subscribe to that philosophy. We subscribe to the idea that the more you input, the greater your output or benefit. The idea that I have to do nothing and the Holy Spirit can do something in my life that is so dramatic is beyond comprehension. I can't imagine how that could happen. And even still, we struggle with it. Because what we want to do is we see the relationship between me actually having control of a situation and being able to manipulate the situation so that I can fix it. But if I don't have my hands on it, I don't understand how God could do it. Because God has set in place certain ways that he wants to do things. And one of the things that he's done is he's set in place the whole idea of worship. The reason that he's looking for worship is, is not because he's looking for people to come to him and just extol him and make sure that he's so great. Part of the reason that he's looking for worship is, is because when you're a worshiper, you become like what you worship. When you worship him and you recognize what he's all about, you become like that. Part of the challenge with it is we see the problems in our life. And you know what we do? We worship the problems. You know what we do? We spend every day thinking about the problem. We host the problem. And when we host the problem, we think about the problem. We consider the problem. We mull the problem over. And the next thing we know, our emotions are in sync with the problem. And I feel so terrible because I'm hosting the problem and I'm conforming to the problem. And the next thing I know, my thoughts are all about the problem. Everything's the problem and how about the problem? My decision making is all calculated to try and fix the problem. What do doctors say about 90 some odd percent of illnesses are psychosomatic? Yeah. You spend your life hosting the problem, it's gonna have a physiological effect on you. That's the whole purpose. We were designed as worshipers. Worship is not when you come into church and you raise your hands and that is very important. And it's important because it'll take you into a realm of trust and corporate experience of the Holy Spirit that, you, that is vital. But really, worship in our lives is when we conform our lives to what we host. What God is saying is, I want you to host me. I want you to host the Holy Spirit. I want your focus and your preoccupation in everything that you do to be me. When you focus on him all the time, in your decision making, in your circumstances, in your situations, you'll find that all of a sudden, your emotions start to conform to who he is and what he's all about. When you're thinking about him all the time, it'll affect the way that you view the circumstances and the situations of your life. It'll affect the language that comes out of your mouth. What he's saying is, I'm looking for people who are worshipers. I'm looking for people who live a lifestyle of being sensitive to me and to my presence in them. I'm looking for people who are conforming all the time to what it is that I'm wanting to do in their lives. Part of the challenge that we have is that we have churches that are looking because they can't deliver against the promises, so what they say is, I understand that all of a sudden relevance has been compromised. And people are looking at it and they're saying, all you're giving me is theories and telling me how I need to live as a good person. And then you're make me, making me feel really bad because I can't live up to that. Yeah. I don't need that. So nobody's interested in what we have to offer. So what we do is we go out and we, de we de design special clubs social clubs. We get people to come in and we get them connected to each other. Because it's our little social network. We develop a social structure in people's lives. Because it's a substitute for the presence. And sometimes we don't have social networks. What we do is we have great entertainment. Come in and we've got flashing lights and we've got great screens and we've got excellent music. And There's nothing wrong with all of that stuff. There's nothing wrong with being social. The point is you don't come to church to be entertained. You don't come to church for social connection. You come to church to have an encounter with the presence. So Jesus says to them, wait for the Holy Spirit to come in uh, upon you and he will give you power and you will be witnesses. The whole point of it is, 
that you will be something. It's power to become. That's the whole point. The point of the Holy Spirit coming upon you is that you can become, it's about power to become. To become what? To become all that he said that you can be. To become the fullness of God in me. What he's designed me to be. To be in a situation more than a conqueror. To be an overcomer. That's what he's designed me to be. The result of the power coming upon me is for me to move into something that changes and transforms who I am. God is not only going to work in you, but he's going to work through you. The whole point of the Holy Spirit giving you power to be something means that he's going to start working on your character because he wants you to become an expression of the fruit of the Spirit. Don't try and be love. You're not going to do it. Don't try and be kind. You're not going to do it. You have to live a lifestyle of worship. You have to live a lifestyle where he is the focus of my life all day, every day. It's a preoccupation with the presence. And when I'm focused on that, things start to happen in me without me having to get involved and try and make it happen. If you try and make it happen, you're engaged in works. It's not sustainable. He's going to do something in you, but he's also going to do something through you. But the other reason that he gives you power to be is because what he wants for you to do is he wants you for you to be the kind of person who is empowered to be able to take the things of the kingdom and bring them into a natural experience. And you need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. God's power is not some force that kind of floats around the earth. And if you need something done, you look for God's power to intervene. The power of God is a person, a person called the Holy Spirit. If you want or you need the power involved in your life, in your circumstances, what you do is you get into a place where you host and you invite in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit comes in, the Holy Spirit brings in his nature and part of his nature is power. So when the Holy Spirit arrives, power arrives. Things happen because that's who he is. That's what he's about. It's not a nebulous force. It's not some airy-fairy thing that floats around out there. It's something that's very practical. God's looking for us to engage the Holy Spirit in relationship in not some strange fashion. Focus on the Holy Spirit being a part of your life. There is a practical way to look at it. Okay, I've got a decision to make. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. What should I do here? How do I address this? How do I handle this? What do I say in this situation? I start to develop a lifestyle that is presence-centered. And I begin to change. If we're going to move into a situation where we want to experience the presence of God and we want him to do something in our lives, we have to be people of courage. Because people of courage are people who are prepared to have a look at their lives and their beliefs and their sacred cows objectively. Sometimes we don't go very far with God because the things that we believe and the things that we hold to actually prevent us from moving forward. Some people have sacred cows about stuff. You can touch anything you want in my life and you can talk about any other part of my Christian experience, but don't touch on that. And that includes God. What we know about God is a drop in the ocean. It's tiny. No matter what your understanding might be, no matter how vast your knowledge base may be, I can promise you, it's nowhere near what God has to offer. And if we live in a place of humility and we live in a place of being teachable, we put ourselves in a place where we allow God to work in our lives and to grow on that. God wants to always take us somewhere. We're always growing in understanding and in truth. 
We don't have full knowledge. The way that we, we advance and the way that we mature in the kingdom is like little children, childlike faith. Sometimes what ends up happening is that we think that we're experts in areas. And when you think that you're in an expert in an area, invariably what you think is that nobody else can teach you anything. And you think, I actually have comprehensive knowledge of this. And when you do that, what you've done is you've just kept your maturity. Yeah. And then you don't go any further with God. Yeah. You sit at that level. And he can't take you anywhere, not because he doesn't want to, but because you think you know everything. There are gonna be times when God wants to do certain things in your life and he may do it in ways that you may not understand, but we need to be open and available to do that. You see, the word of God is gonna give us an understanding of the nature of God, but it's never designed to put in place limitations as to how he elects to express himself. He may choose to do things in ways that we may not necessarily think are appropriate. Can we live with that? Sometimes what we have to do is we have to get to a place where we have a look at situations and we allow God to work with us in that and let him grow us to a place where we have understanding based on our experience, not on our preconceived ideas. We are a teaching church. We have been a teaching church for 30 years. It's a very strong foundation. It's a foundational pillar to this ministry. And teaching is very, very important. It's so fundamental to who we are. And all teaching is based on the word. So we never want to take away from that and I never want you to leave here thinking in any ways that we're compromising the value of the word. I don't mean for that to happen at all. But I think that there is a place where what God is doing is he's taking the teaching, he's taking the word and he's moving us forward. And so we're moving to a space where we're happily marrying the word and the spirit. Jesus was the word made flesh. Yeah. Jesus was the living word. If you read in Luke chapter 14, it speaks about Jesus' ministry started when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him. Jesus' ministry started when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him. Jesus was the word. He had all of that. He was the word made flesh. But he had to wait until the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him before he started his ministry. Jesus runs into a group of believers and he says, I'll tell you what, here's all the authority. You've got all the authority. But you know what? You're not equipped yet to go out into the world. You've got my words, you've got the authority, but you've got to wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you and gives you the power. If Jesus and the disciples had the word and they had to have the Holy Spirit and the power as well, we need exactly the same. Amen. We're often comfortable with the word because the word is easier to navigate. Malachi 3.6, go and read it. You can read it. I can see it. Enter into relationship, question mark. What does that mean? What does it mean? It's so much more difficult because I can't always define it in simple terms. The word is so much easier because I have it available and accessible. It's sitting right here, I can read it. But when you talk, speak to me about engaging God in a relational context, that's hard for me to understand and even more difficult for me to navigate and walk into that. Can I have five minutes? Yeah. On the, after the day of Pentecost, when the disciples came out, remember this, they never had the New Testament. It wasn't written. They didn't stand in front of the crowd and say, okay, let's all open our Bibles to John 3, 16. <laughs> what happened? 
Their theology came into, his, it came into existence as a result of what they saw God doing. We have too many people want to exist in the realm of thought as opposed to being engaged in action. We want to philosophize and think about and hypothesize and get all the ideas. and We want to sort everything out and cross the T's and dot the I's and when everything's sorted out and we've got enough word, then we'll do something with God. And we do nothing. We do nothing. God never called us to be people of head knowledge. He called us to be people of action. The problem with it is, when you spend too much time in word without the balance of relationship, what ends up happening is it becomes formula driven. And so I, 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 I keep doing things by formula, by rote, because that's what happens. Quote the word, stand on scripture, believe in faith, confession, okay, where's the result? Waiting, waiting, waiting. It's the formula. I've got the word, but I don't have the spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't formula driven. He's relationally driven. I gotta have him. The problem with it is when we spend too much time in the word and we don't balance it with a, I need 10 minutes, not five. If you have to go, if you have to go, please go. I understand. If you have the word and you don't balance it with the relational aspect, what ends up happening is we become people who become so preoccupied with the detail that we become inhibited about doing anything. Because it won't be perfect. What happens if I don't just pray the right way? Or what happens if I lay my hands on them beforehand and I should I pray after they lay my hands? Where do my hands? I always think about stuff. I want to, and God's like, just do it. There comes a place in our Christian relationship where you just gotta do something. Get in contact with him and if he says do it, just do it. Yes, it's a risky proposition. And I can tell you now, it doesn't matter how much time you spent in any church. It doesn't matter how many times you've been through training center. It doesn't matter how many hours you sit and watch Christian television. You're never gonna feel as though you have enough word on you or you're mature enough to do it. If you're waiting for that feeling, Listen to me, this is the second thing you've got to remember. It's never gonna happen. It doesn't work that way. God is motivated, motivated by faith, not your expansive knowledge base. Faith, do something with it. Don't be afraid. Don't worry if the wheels come off and you get it all wrong. So what? You think you're the first person who's ever done that? But what if it does work? Yeah. Just do it. And if you get it wrong the first time, or the second time, or the third time, keep going, you'll get it. There are some things in the kingdom that you're gonna learn through experience that you're never gonna learn in a classroom. It's not gonna happen. And as long as you're sitting behind the desk trying to sort it all out, and so that you're comfortable doing it, you're never gonna to get to that place. Just do it. We've gotta become people who are prepared to take risk and be prepared to sit and say, listen, if we're focused and we're interested in becoming, if we're interested in being people of experience, if we're interested in taking the word of God and making it experiential, I gotta do something. I can't talk about that and do nothing. Do something. When God starts to move, sometimes it becomes a risky business because I think what you have to do is you're gonna have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you because there is not time and it's not appropriate and I don't think it adds any value to do an exegetical study on Jesus' sermons to find out what you should be doing next. <laughs> It's not to take away from the word of God. Think about this, think about this. The disciples, after the day of Pentecost, never had the word to guide them. What they did is they went out and they were led by the Holy Spirit, who said, do this, don't do that. Pray for this person, don't pray for them. Put mud on their eyes, send them to the river. 
Karstadt Liebman out. But they did something. They didn't have to sit down and say, okay, let's all have a Bible study and let's just talk about, you know, the way that we think that this is happening and how we should define the next move of God. When you're too busy doing, you don't have time to sit and say, well, let's just try and find out exactly how it happened. You don't define how it happens unless you've had the encounter and the experience. You got to get into it. And when you get into it, then you have a look at it and say, okay, fine. Scripture's vital. Got to make sure it conforms to Scripture. Okay, nobody's deviating from that. Nobody's saying throw Scripture out. It conforms to Scripture. But all we're saying is that there is a balance between the Spirit and the Word. You got to have the two. You cannot live in life off the Logos. It's not going to happen. How do we do this? Great outpourings of God, great moves of God, revival, doesn't come about as a result of extensive study. It comes about as a result of deep worship. You see, worship is relational. Worship is all about sitting saying, you know what, I recognize that the life is on the inside of me. How do I spend time meditating on that, in relationship with that, considering it? You want a practical way to walk into to worship? Think about it before you make decisions. See what you feel on the inside of you. Listen to the voice on the inside of you. The more you begin to refer to the life that's on the inside of you, the more you are conforming to what you ascribe value and worth to. And when you keep your focus on that, you will become like that. It's about submission. It's about obedience. And it's about hunger. How much do you want it? How much do you want it? If there's no appetite, there's no inclination. So what do we want? What do you want for your life and what do you want corporately? Psalm 22, God inhabits the praises of his people. God inhabits the praises of his people. When you inhabit a place, you live in a place. When you move into a a place, when you move into a home and you live there, it becomes a place that you customize so it becomes an expression of you. It expresses who you are. When people walk into your home, it looks like you. What you value, what you're about, your personality, your taste, it's you. When God inhabits the praises of his people, he comes into, an, into a space and he inhabits that space. And he customizes that space so that it becomes a reflection of him. It becomes something that reflects his nature and who he's all about. That's why praise and worship is important. Because when we worship him from a corporate point of view, we create an atmosphere where we reverence and we respect the presence, where we invite it in, and we create a space where he's able to touch and change people's lives as a result of that. The word's vital. The word is gonna speak to you about possibilities and it's gonna paint pictures of possibilities. But the Holy Spirit is going to ignite potential. You got to have them both. You got to have them both. Because when we have them together, that's when we move forward as effective witnesses. That's when we become and we have the power to be what He's called us to be. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your presence here today, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, it's the desire of our heart to create a space that is pleasing to you, a space where you are honored and reverenced. 
I pray, Holy Spirit, that you begin to touch each person's life here right now and that you begin to do something tremendous in their lives. I pray that you will build into them a sensitivity to your life that's on the inside of them and that with regular intervals, you will give them the prompting to refer to the life that's on the inside. Make us people who are worshipers. Make us people who are always referring back to the life that's on the inside of us, who are conforming our thoughts and our ideas and our words and our languaging and our vision in line with that. We bless you and we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen.